locals call this place the last paradise, and it doesn't take long to work out why. It has a classic subtropical climate, a coral reef just metres from the shore, and a vast array of unique wildlife. Lord Howe Island is as picturesque as it is remote. About 700 kilometres northeast of Sydney, it's World Heritage listed and was declared a marine park in 2000. This tiny island has been blessed. It boasts the world's southernmost coral reef and lagoon. The remains of a spectacular volcano, Mount Gower, soaring to nearly a thousand metres. Even more impressive is its flora and fauna. And for bird watchers, it really is paradise. Here at Lord Howe Island, we've got more seabirds breeding than anywhere else in Australia. People from all over the world come to experience this. Naturalist Ian Hutton is Lord Howe's resident bird expert. After 30 years, he still marvels at what he sees here. Well, these are all sooty terns, and it's the height of their breeding time at the moment, so a lot of these birds that we're seeing along here they're actually the juveniles. Some are just starting to fly, but others probably a week or two off flying. 53% of the island's plant species are found nowhere else on Earth. Two thirds of the thousands of invertebrates, including the phasmid, are also unique to Lord Howe. So too is the flightless wood hen. A young sooty tern, probably three or four days old. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so his parents are off getting food at the moment? That's right, just leave them here in the grass and they, they hide and when the parents come in they call out. The chick recognises that call and calls back. So it's a bit of a call recognition. So we'll just put him down here and mum and dad will come back and feed him. <laughs> Off into the grass he goes. <laughs> Ian Hutton calls these trees high-rise apartments for birds. Black Noddies started breeding here again in 1990 with about 10 pairs. Now there are 350. Sometimes in the summer, if we get these strong winds, they, the chicks do fall out of the trees. And it's just part of nature. The parents won't feed them, they won't pick them up. So, um, yeah, every year there could be 20 or 30 of these chicks lost if we get these strong winds in summer. Only about 350 people live on Lord Howe permanently. And there's a cap on tourist numbers limiting visitors to no more than 400 at a time. The island is officially part of New South Wales, but there are no mobile phones and no plans for any. The speed limit is 25 kilometres per hour. The land is all leasehold, and locals get first option on any property which goes to market. This is a small community where pretty much everyone knows everyone else and a lot of people here have nicknames like Friendly, Alki, Captain and helpfully in this weighty tome, the Lord Howe Island Telephone Directory, a lot of people have their nickname with their listing. You'll find people like Buzzer, Frizzy, Bing and Bonk. Just as much of Lord Howe's wildlife is unique, so are its people. G'day. The island was uninhabited when the first settlers arrived from the other side of the world. 
I was born on the island. My dad was born on the island and his family go right back to the 1840s. I go back six generations, my kids are seven. Yeah, back to Nathan Thompson. He was a, an American whaler all the way over from Nantucket that um, landed on our shores with a couple of island princesses from <laughs> Kiribati picked up and that was my great, great grandparents. They'd like some assistance over here to cake. Lisa Retmock, like most locals, relies on tourism to make a living. She's just been elected to the seven-member board which runs the island. Yeah, I think I'm more of a white girl. You know, it's a thankless task being a representative on the board. You know, you, particularly in our little community where, you know, there's, what, 350 people, most of us are related. Yeah. So issues um, that you might be making a decision on is going to affect someone personally that you know. So it's, you know, you've got to be open and fair and accountable and um, answerable and that's hard in a little community. So I think, you know, that's awkward sometimes. While the island's isolation has provided a haven for wildlife, it's presented enormous challenges for the human inhabitants. In the early days, the only way to get here was an often perilous ocean journey. The freighter Jacques Delmar II calls once every three weeks with supplies that don't always get ashore. The angry swell outside the reef is forever hazardous, and in fact, this is where Jacques Delmar No. 1 ended up several years ago. Seaplanes came next, landing in the lagoon. While the lagoon's shallow, warm and beautifully clear water must be about the world's most attractive landing spot, the sharp island tides make it a further worry to the airline operators. A romantic way to travel, but at the mercy of the weather. Everyone gets a personal welcome as they step ashore, while a rough and ready signboard and recorded music fill out the greeting. In 1974, the construction of an airstrip meant daily flights were possible, but only for smaller aircraft. Major cargo still has to come by sea on the regular service from the mainland. Being such a remote community, we do need to be very self-sufficient. The isolation of, of the island certainly presents physical challenges as in getting, getting supplies or, or services or materials. It also creates some, some challenges at a, a small island and a, and a small community. But it also, many benefits come from that as well. You leave your, your keys in the car, uh, the children are safe to, to ride on the roads on the island. Uh, most people, uh, most of the kids use bikes to get around here, as, as do the tourists. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a very, a very safe, very safe place and uh, people look out for each other. And again, in, in small communities, there is a, a, real, a real spirit of, of community here and people, people help each other out. And when there's a, an important issue for the community, then, then people come together. Good morning. Signal Barney speaking. This is the modest office of the Lord Howe Island Signal. It's been covering all the local news that's fit to print since the 1950s. Editor Barney Nichols is preparing this week's edition the old fashioned way. The janitor, the copy boy, the stapler, the post boy, the lot. People slide the door across and leave little ads or, or various other articles there. The place is unlocked. They stop me in the street. It's, did you know? Um, they drop things in at the post office. Are there ever any scandals on Lord Howe Island? Yes, indeed there are, but they don't get printed. Because of its world heritage status, the island has some of the best conservation policies in the world. At the state-of-the-art local tip, 
or as it's officially termed the Waste Management Facility, up to 80% of the island's waste is either recycled or reused. Local restaurants provide fresh rainwater to cut down on the use of plastic bottles, and plastic bags are discouraged. But in recent years, there's been growing environmental concerns not of the locals making. Lord Howe is a tiny speck in the middle of the Tasman Sea, a long way from anywhere. Well, there's a large water current called the East Australian Current that flows right down the east coast, uh, Queensland, New South Wales and more or less swells around in the Tasman Sea and it's that water current that's bringing the plastic towards Lord Howe Island. Lord Howe Island is only 11 kilometres long and 2 kilometres wide. During his daily wanderings, Ian Hutton started to notice assorted pieces of plastic on the island's beaches and forest floors. He began measuring and collecting it and was dismayed at what he found. Ian, yeah, there's an astonishing assortment of things in here. I mean, this, this looks like a, a little hair clip, a child's hair clip. Um, milk, top. milk top of yeah. some sort, wine, uh, wine lid, biro. It's amazing, the diversity of stuff. You yeah. just wouldn't believe it. In Something from aerosol, yeah. spray. Incredible. In, it is. Well, in mm. every facet of our life, plastics used, mm. really. Mm. Probably the biggest item we get in terms of numbers of identifiable pieces are these balloon ties. So when people let go a party balloon, maybe at a football match, they might let go a thousand. These go up and out over the ocean and drop. The species most at risk is the flesh-footed shearwater or mutton bird. Lord Howe is home to the only breeding population of these birds in Eastern Australia. At this time of year, the best way to see the mutton birds on land is after dark, in the middle of the island's dense palm forests. There's one over here I can see. The birds nest in a burrow, so they dig a burrow two or three metres long. They make a little nest chamber at the end, and at this time of the year, one of the birds is down there sitting on the egg. The other, one of the couple's out at sea feeding, and they swap over every few days. But it's what the birds collect out at sea that can be deadly. This kind of speaks for itself. This is shocking. So we can see right away, very, very significant quantity of plastic inside this bird. It's quite remarkable. There's no doubt that this bird died as a result of this plastic ingestion. When researcher Jennifer Lavers dissected this bird, she found more than 200 pieces of plastic in its stomach. Tragically, it's thought to be a world record for plastic in a seabird. It was the equivalent of a human carrying 12 kilograms of plastic in the stomach. So it was 15% of the body weight of that chick. The Lord Howe Island School is the most remote in New South Wales. For the barefoot students, a key part of their education is learning about the environment, taking a hands-on approach. What are you gluing, that little triangle? Yeah, if you just put a blob in there, there's a little bit there. There you go, that looks good. They went down to the beach the morning we started on this and spent the morning collecting, sorting. You know, finding all the stuff. The children are working on a mural made of plastics found on their beaches with the help of artist Margaret Murray. We're thinking it'll end up in the museum because we're going to do a display down there on the plastics. We're hoping it'll give a message that other people will see and think, 
That's all come off the beaches here. This is Ned's Beach, consistently voted one of the cleanest beaches in Australia. And this really brings home the problem with plastics. In about 30 seconds walking along the shore here, I've managed to pick up probably about 20 pieces of plastic, bottle lids, all sorts of debris, and this is deadly for the birds. Fish don't seem to set well as birds, but also the turtles. We have a lot of instances where some turtles have ingesting plastics, and they're more macro plastics. Often we think that it's the big plastics that we can see that are the worst, but sometimes it's the smaller ones that the fish and turtles can't recognise, which can cause the damage. As well as continuing research on land, specially designed nets are being towed in the waters around the island to measure exactly how much plastic is floating there. It's very much community driven. The Lord Howe Island Museum formed a plastics committee on the island. We provided some funding to do some sampling on the surface. This is, this is one of many places in the world which are doing these samples and try and get back to the plastic industry and people to make a decision to reduce plastics and reuse what we've got. But the island has had some major success stories, like the flightless Lord Howe Island wood hen. Even though sometimes it appears reluctant to be helped. Okay, he's coming towards um, Kenny. Coming up to you, Christo. Here he comes. He's coming out to you, Kenny. Here he comes. Here he's coming back in. Here he comes. Here he comes. Here he comes. Here he's coming back in. Come around to go. Go across that. Run, run, run. Get in. Get him. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> One of the world's rarest birds, it was on the brink of extinction. But in 1980, a captive breeding program was established, taking the handful of surviving birds found on the very top of Mount Gower. Well, the population now is estimated about three to 400 birds throughout the entire island. The uh, population when they first captured these species was, um, they got seven, seven to 10 breeding pairs. Okay, we're just gonna weigh the bird first and get a measurement with the bag weight. 580. I think they're pretty sustainable now. And I think if we eliminate the threats, then they'll probably increase a lot more. After years of heated debate, a full-scale rat eradication program is set to begin on the island in 2015. That's good news for the wood hen and also for perhaps the most remarkable of Lord Howe's creatures, Drycosilus australis, or the phasmid. Feral animals have wreaked havoc on Lord Howe over the years, especially rats. The black rat arrived on the island back in 1918 when a supply ship ran aground off the coast. They led to the extinction of five different species of bird and several types of beetle. It was also thought the rat had killed off a creature that's found nowhere else on Earth. After no sightings for close to a century, a phasmid skeleton was found here at Ball's Pyramid, 23 kilometres to the southeast. This stark landmark is part of the same volcano responsible for the formation of Lord Howe. An expedition was sent to take a closer look. 
accessing these areas was really quite gnarly. You've got a really steep, potentially dangerous environment. Where we were going across this vertical face, we had breakers coming in and lapping up against our feet. Ranger Dean Hisco and his team searched for two days without success. Then, late one night... We were just gobsmacked to actually encounter these prehistoric looking insects on a couple of big Malaluka bushes on a ledge up on the, on the face of the pyramid. Just really, you know, stuff you don't forget. So this is a real success story to see one of these or multiple numbers of these now. Well, it's almost a miracle because they were thought to be extinct for 90 years. What's now causing real excitement on Lord Howe is that they've managed to successfully breed phasmids back here on the island. We've cracked it. We've, we've worked it out. But at the moment, you can't let them out. They can't no, be allowed out into... Well, they'd, they'd be eaten by uh, rodents. So essentially, they've got to live in their, their little house here they've, until you get rid of the rats. They're captive... They're in captive management for their own benefit. Hopefully one day we can show them where they really should belong, somewhere out there. It's dangerous work, collecting palm seeds the way it's always been done on the island. Of all the rare plant species found here, this is the one that's made the island's name and its fortune, the Kentia palm. First exported almost 150 years ago, it's gone on to become one of the most popular indoor plants in the world. And these all came from, obviously, somewhere in the island. That's where yep. they all started. Definitely, and they're all hand collected um, and harvested and things like that. So um, it's a very uh, hands-on sort of game for us anyway. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, as you can see here, the girls are harvesting some of the seedlings that have come up. There's only 350 people here. Um, so we've got, say, five full-time jobs just in this industry alone. We've got um, the cedars, so you've got about a dozen cedars as well. Um, we ship the palms out through the airlines as well, so they've got employees there as well. Uh, so it affects every little piece of um, society and has since the 1800s. The islanders no longer have a monopoly over their palm tree. There's competition from nurseries as far away as Sicily and the Canary Islands. But they're convinced the Lord Howe Kentia is still the original and the best. In terms of um, volume, we've probably got the highest volume that sends out. We've definitely got the, um, the best quality of um, seedling, most consistent seedling quality goes out. And it's a lot of plants, you know, a million plants just in seedlings, plus all these um, potted plants here for the tourist trade as well. So it really adds up over the 12 months. Like many islands in the Pacific, the dominant religion here is the Seventh-day Adventist church, and Saturday is the Sabbath. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity of giving back to you some of that which you have loaned to us. The local people in this earthly paradise have a lot to give thanks for. It's like a lifestyle that maybe our parents had or generations before us and uh, you can't find anywhere else in the world. It's laid back, there's no crime, you don't have a great deal to worry about. The fact that we can just roam freely around the island most places and you can go to Blinkies, Neds, Middle, any place that you really want. 
like if you want to because it's really safe here and um, it's just a great place to live, especially if you're young like me. I've lived here my whole life and I love the being around nature a lot. It's, it's really nice seeing all the animals like roaming around in the bush. I like the wood hen because they're fun to chase around. You can just see by looking at them, they're pretty funny to watch. <laughs> They've got a lot of character and they're intelligent. There's a group of people here who cherish the island and have taken really strong ownership in looking after an environment and take great pride. So I think culturally, which is something that often is overlooked, that the islanders have really looked after Lord Howe and really that's the reason that we have such a special and incredibly unique environment still here. The custodians of this remarkable place struggle to find words to describe the deep connection they have with their island home. All islanders feel the same way. It's hard to explain because it's such an emotional, deep-rooted, almost a spiritual thing. Flying on the plane and I look at that perfect little beautiful spot in the ocean down there and I almost cry. It's, it's very emotional, so it means an enormous amount. Yeah, its future means an enormous amount and protecting it means an enormous amount.